very happy to kick off this session. And uh, today I'm going to present you part of my thesis, which is based on my research on lawyers who are working in online legal, service, online legal services in China. And in this paper, this study examines one particular challenge that online platform work are imposing on professional workers. That is the challenge on their professional identity. Oh, I should make sure, can everyone see my slides? Okay, good. Yeah, so this study uh, examines specifically on the challenge of online platform work on professional workers, I professional identity. That is their self-concept of what it means to be part of this profession. And this qualitative research draws together both the perspectives of the IR scholars who are working in online gig work and also the organizational theorists' interest in professions and professional workers. Um, so um, for the time being, I certainly do not have the time to uh, give you a comprehensive uh, uh, literature review to fully contextualize this study. But just to help uh, with the theoretical contextualization, I will first introduce a concept that is central to this study, that is counter-institutional identity. Counter-institutional identity is a fairly recently developed concept. And the key features of a strong counter-institutional identity included, be, um, first of all, being in opposition to the values and the principles that are dominant in the field. And secondly, diverge from the roles that are established through typical socialization. And lastly, involving practices that are proudly construed in direct contrast to the field norms. So as an example, I believe most of the graduates of doctoral programs in social sciences would ha have to experience this country institutional identification process if they get a job to teach in high schools, because um, the expectations, the principles, norms of the K-12 education diverge drastically from what is expected from a university faculty member, which is what these doctoral programs are training their students for. And I will explain why um, the, this concept of counter-institutional identity is quite suitable to explore my uh, empirical setting to, in the findings section. There are two other concepts that you will have to bear with me for repeating quite many times in the next probably uh, 30 minutes. So the first one is identity threats. That is the experiences that are subjectively evaluated as indicating potential harms to the values, meanings, and enactment of an identity. And the second, con second uh, concept that I will have to uh, repeat many times is identity work. That is the efforts to craft, revise, and stabilize one's identities. Okay, with these uh, background knowledge of these frequent terms, the questions that I will try, I'm trying to answer in this study include, first of all, how do counter-institutional work settings affect individuals' professional identity? And secondly, what are the identity threats facing the professional workers who work in the online platform-based arrangements? And lastly, how do these professionals cope with these identity threats? Uh, to answer these questions, I draw on data from um, one of China's largest and most successful online legal service platforms. And the way this platform operates is quite similar to Uber, especially in terms of how it connects clients with lawyers and how it handles all the transactions and how it uh, manages the payroll of the lawyers. And primary data for this study is 51 um, interview uh, 51 in-depth semi-structured interviews with lawyers uh, who are regularly working on this platform and there are also a few additional data sources including the interviews with the managers of the platform uh, service records from 2018 and documents that uh, shared that are shared by the both the managers and the interviewed lawyers to analyze my data i used a, a method called a grounded theory approach, which is a highly systematic methodology for inductively analyzing qualitative data. 
and it typically has three steps. The first step involves open coding and then clustering the common themes into the professional uh, pr provisional category, uh, categories or first order themes. And the second step involves consolidating these first order themes into more abstract, more theoretical, a higher level um, theoretical categories. And the last step is to um, uh, further aggregating these theoretical uh, dimensions and then develop, put them into a coherent theoretical framework. So the findings of these three steps are summarized in this and next slide, these two slides. So the findings from the first step, the first order themes are in these uh, square boxes and uh, the theoretical categories are in this column and these are, uh, this column are the aggregated theoretical dimensions. So with this method, I identified five, in total of five counter-institutional work features of online legal services that fall into two main categories, work content and the client relations. So in terms of work content, because of the low pricing and uh, easy access to online services, um, this platform has a lot of um, less unimportant, trivial, and uh, low difficulty cases that are usually not worth the hassle of finding a lawyer if there's no uh, easy and accessible online arrangements. And there are also some legally irrelevant questions, non-legal questions asked ask on this platform. And in, as to client relations, because of the importance of client ratings in influencing lawyers' for future work opportunities and future income, the online services are often dominated by what the clients want instead of what lawyers have to, uh, have to offer. Therefore, lawyers are having much, much low, uh, lower power than in a typical offline uh, lawyer-client relationship. And for the same reason, the clients in online services often have much lower respect for their lawyers. At least they show much lower respect for their lawyers. And I also identified three dimensions of professional identities where I observed a lot of cross individual differences. And these five, uh, the first dimension is expertise specialization, which is essentially the lawyer's level of specialization in defining what type of lawyer I am. Some lawyers I interviewed have quite narrow and specific areas of interest and expertise, for example, medical disputes or specific, a specific type of divorce cases. But some lawyers are more general in terms of what they do. They basically would accept any kind of work they can find. And um, uh, this is the difference in expertise specialization. The second dimension where there's a lot of uh, cross individual differences are the service orientation versus expert centrality. Um, which indicates the degrees to which the lawyers believe that legal services should prioritize um, client satisfaction and client, ex client experiences, or should it give more respect and uh, more respect to lawyers' expertise and autonomy. And the last dimension is belief in professional dynamism, which is lawyers' belief that the legal profession is dynamic, is constantly changing, such that it is following and will continue follow, uh, continue to follow the changing social trends and keep adopting those various innovations driven by new technologies. And consequently, lawyers should be openly embracing the changes in their work content and the client relations and to keep updating their skill sets and mindsets to adapt to the new changes. With the same method, I also found uh, identified two types of client uh, identity threats and four types in total of four types of identity work that fall into two main, category, uh, two main groups, protecting versus constructing, uh, restructuring uh, identity work. And I will give more details of these identity threats and identity work in the final theoretical framework that I'm proposing. So in this model, 
in this uh, final theoretical model, I uncovered how the three dimensions of professional identity underpin both the generations of these identity threats and in the diver divergence in individual lawyers' choices over protecting or restructuring identity work. To start with, the first identity threat, the first identity threat arises from the conflict between work content and expertise specialization. Particularly, this identity threat is especially strong among the lawyers who have a clear and a narrower specialization and therefore attach much higher value to their own services than their, their own time. And are, these lawyers with a stronger and narrower expertise specialization are more likely to see these counter-institutional work content in online services as a waste of time and challenging their professional identity. The second identity threat, uh, status loss, was rooted in the drastically changed client relations and its conflict with uh, the service orientation versus expertise centrality. Specifically, this identity threat is much weaker among the lawyers who have a higher level of uh, service orientation. And many of these lawyers often tend to believe that um, law, the law is nothing more than a regular service industry and not that different from waiting in a restaurant. And therefore, they should put their client satisfaction and client experience at the most as the most important in their work. And these lawyers are more likely, uh, are, are more likely to have a much weaker experience of status loss. Faced with these two identity threats, some lawyers chose to protect um, chose to uh, resist these changes and protect their pre-existing identity work. Some lawyers use a technique uh, that I term as framing and distancing. They often frame the online work as something that is distant from their main careers. For example, they frame it as a type of leisure or uh, a type of um, so per social behavior, helping other people so as to protect their more privileged uh, professional identity that they experienced, they enacted from their offline work. And the second protecting identity work is called, um, I term it as tailoring work content. And apparently the autonomy of online platforms um, gives the lawyers the freedom to choose what tasks to work on. And they can therefore tailor their own work content and filter out those most counter-institutional work content. On the contrary, some lawyers are more, more open to these uh, counter-institutional work features and are actively trying to rationalize these new work features so as to restructure their overall professional identity. And the first technique, uh, the first tactic that um, is, is um, reframing professional ideals which is rethinking about what's the legal professions, what's the legal profession should be like, especially in terms of um, the degrees of service orientation it should um, display. And the, the next tactic that I found was modeling with other fields. Some lawyers, a lot of lawyers make frequent references to other fields that are impacted um, by the internet driven innovations. For example, some lawyers made references to Uber and its Chinese equivalent to, to try and uh, rationalize the much lower pricing of online services. And I found that the belief in um, professional dynamism underlies lawyers' tendencies to choose to use protecting versus restructuring identity work. And apparently the lawyers who have a stronger belief, who believe that the, law, the legal profession is and will be changing are more likely to restructure their professional identity. So this is the, uh, the theoretical framework that I'm, trying, I'm proposing in this study. And in terms of the theoretical contribution, in addition to finding a few additional types of identity threats and identity work, uh, to add to the current research on professional identity, I made uh, the, the, the thing that the main contribution that this uh, study is making is to try and use 
uh, one dimension of professional identity, the belief in uh, professional dynamism, to explain the divergence between either protecting or restructuring identity work. And to, to add to the research on contra institutional identity, I give a closer look at the individual level process, ind individual level um, dynamics in the in the counter institutional identification process and there is also a few pr practical implications and yes that is um, uh, all of my presentation and i will welcome welcome any comments and feedbacks as to how how to improve this um, this paper thanks Thank you very much, Yao Yao. Uh, that's fantastic. You are right on time. We're going to proceed through all of the presentations, partly because of this remote delivery um, challenge with the technology, and save all of the questions for um, the discussion period that follows. So mm -hmm. without further ado, I'm going to invite Rosalina Omar to present Exploring the Experiences of South Asian Women Immigrant Teachers in Toronto. Over to you, Rosalina. Hello, hi, can you hear me? Okay, okay. So yes, I am Rosalina Omar. I am a doctoral candidate at the OEC at the University of Toronto. Um, I'm very happy to share my experiences with you, uh, even though it was not an expected platform, but still it's a nice opportunity to, to share my experiences um, in this situation. So um, today I'm sharing my, some snapshots of my uh, thesis. It's about uh, the experiences of South Asian female. Um, uh, it's very common that despite a significant number of uh, skilled immigrant women that come from South Asia to Canada, very few of them are employed in suitable or the same career that they had pursued in their native land. Uh, and usually we know that lack of Canadian experience, family responsibility, uh, and lack of networking uh, are the common factors behind the struggle of uh, immigrant women to attain their desired careers. But a significant number of South Asian uh, immigrant women who work as teachers in their native land are still struggling with their profession even after upgrading their skills and qualifications in Canada. Many women end up in the racialized and gendered preca precarious labor sector where previous education and skills are systematically devaluated. Uh, many researchers have examined the labor market exploration uh, of skilled immigrant women from different angles in Canadian context. Most of the literature focuses on the difficulties uh, that are encountered by immigrant women in obtaining the same or suitable uh, profession in general. And my research contributes to this discussion by examining the experiences of South Asian female school teachers and their struggles coping with undesirable jobs or unsatisfactory professional situations even after completing skill upgrades. Now, the reason uh, like I like to elaborate that why did I choose South Asian women? It's a very narrow group. Like why did I choose this research participants uh, participants as my as my research topics? The reasons for choosing South Asian women as my research subjects are multifaceted. Uh, firstly, at present, uh, Toronto consists of the highest number of South Asian communities among all other metropolitan areas in Canada. The presence of a significant number of this group requires demand for academic research that can have an impact on improving their life after migration. Second is studying at OEC as a graduate student has allowed me to know uh, more about the life of skilled South Asian women from my fellow graduate students. As I have witnessed their continuous struggle to have a suitable career while pursuing a graduate degree, and I think that I am well located to examine their experiences. And thirdly, my own position of belonging as a South Asian community provides me with a perspective into the everyday struggle of many women building a career in a new country. I observed the post-migration journey of many South Asian women who gave up their dreams of having a professional job after several attempts to fulfill the requirements of the contemporary job market demands. At the same time, women who were fortunate uh, to, uh, fortunate enough to secure a professional job uh, in Toronto had to deal with various obstacles along their way to success. And I feel that this is not fair since as qualified and entitled professionals, they deserve every right to choose a suitable career like their Canadian-born counterparts. 
The current high growing number of immigrant school aged students in uh, Toronto also encourages me to, um, uh, to research on a minoritized professional community as there is a growing need for teachers with diverse backgrounds to meet those students' uh, requirements. Though the diversity among the students in the Toronto area uh, for the last one or two decades, uh, the extent of diversity among teachers is not similar in many school boards. Uh, compared to the number of uh, certified immigrant uh, teachers, the actual number of immigrant teachers who are working in school is lower. And then which means that uh, many certified teachers are not working in their desired profession. Um, studies have shown that the demographic divide between students of color and teachers is large in Ontario, including Toronto. According to data, racial minorities present 47% of the population, but only make up 20% of secondary school teachers and 18% of elementary school and kindergarten teachers. The Stat Canada prediction suggests that, that this gap could be widened in a decade as racial minorities could make up 63% of Toronto population, and which shows that the urgent need of increasing the composition of the teaching population. Now the question is, why do we need a diverse background of teachers? Research shows that many times students and their families feel comfortable and thrilled in communicating with their first language with the teachers. Moreover, the ability to speak more than one language is often seen as a benefit and advantage. Newcomer parents uh, who might not be comfortable in speaking, um, in communicating in English or French might be benefited if they find a school teacher who can speak in their first language. And it can boost up the parent-teacher communication, uh, which would be helpful, uh, which will be eventually helpful for the student. Moreover, minority students uh, who have a role model to see a teacher who belongs to their community and can speak in their own language, as they can relate with their identity. Teachers of color can influence students of color in many other ways by delivering uh, relevant pedagogy and by introducing the world that marginalize, marginalizes them. And even though it's not, uh, it's not, uh, it should not be generalized for all teachers of color. The emphasis on recruiting more diverse teachers is not a new concept in Canada as well as in Toronto. The concept had started to gain importance since the beginning of the century as scholars or educators believe that teachers with diverse backgrounds have adequate to offer to students, to the education system or to the entire communities. The Ontario provincial government's equity and inclusive Education policy emphasizes on the need for diversity among teachers. However, there is no policy on how this diversity could be achieved because there is no um, requirement that board could collect data, analyze the diversity gap or uh, implement efforts to close the gap. So there is policy, but there is no way we, how we can achieve the goal. Uh, the research participants of my study, as I completed my data collection process and I almost uh, finished my data analyzation, so the research participants of my study have come under the skilled immigration category either by themselves or with their partners or with their family. So immigration policy does not give any assurance of job security for skilled immigration. Researchers claim that though the skilled immigrant uh, programs aims to address the labor shortage of the economy, increasing evidence supports that the majority of the immigration have become unable to secure a permanent position in their field of training. And the cycle goes through reframing their um, qualifications and experiences and downgrading their expectations. So uh, all of my research participants live in Toronto or surrounding area and Toronto occupies a very special, specific, special part of my thesis. Studies have shown that the largest portion of the female immigrant population resides in Toronto. I mean, almost 47% female population live in Toronto, as there is a tendency for immigrant people to settle in or near major urban areas. Living in a metropolitan area or surrounding of a metropolitan area is a uh, fierce pressure on immigrants uh, who already struggle with the lack of sufficient resources. For the past few years, for instance, the crisis of affordable housing has increased a lot and bringing challenges to many South Asian women. The housing prices in Toronto have increased by 23% in the last few years. Property tax and the cost of public transport have also climbed. And all this high ending costs throw a toll on ethnic minorities since in most cases they possess the level immigrant and have less chances to acquire better jobs for the survival in this mega city. So trying to get quick economic standard, many people, they don't have time to concentrate on pursuing their dream job. Rather they, for quick economic earning, like quick, 
money get they, they engage themselves in some sort of precarious job and data also shows that for the first few few years uh, precarious jobs in toronto has been increased almost by 50% and this stress and job security do not allow immigrant people, especially women, to develop the career aspiration as most cases women lack time, energy, and financial support after fulfilling all those family responsibilities. Um, though a great number of uh, diverse teachers have been joining the Ontario teaching course every year, the integration of teachers to the mainstream teaching community has never been linear or homogeneous as each social group faces uh, these challenges differently. The limited number of literature that deal with the highest skilled Asian immigrant women signifies some variables that are not controlled by women, like skills, um, entry, and gender division of work. Like teaching is not like other profession. Uh, skills of teaching are not easily transferable, and it appears to be difficult for some people to acquire a position in this field in a new context, and that's why they require different sorts of training. And also, as most skilled women, women have immigrated uh, with their partners or their family or their husband, which means that they come to Canada as dependent. And this act as a barrier in finding a job in their own field. And moreover, uh, some well-known gender family division of works as obstacles in building up a career after migration. Like we know that mostly women have to um, fulfill all those family responsibilities, child rearing and sort of things. But most of the women, again, when I um, talk with my participants, uh, they, they say something else. They blame, firstly, the cost associated with the various steps of having license. Secondly, lack of information and assessing credentials, systematic devaluation of international credentials, complexities of approving the previous experiences from the back home, and finally, insufficient supplementary training that are needed for teachers from diverse backgrounds. Uh, so the path of acquiring a school teacher from South Asia, I mean, I just want to mention that here, South Asia, I just picked three important countries. I mean, three countries, India, Pakistan, and Bangladesh. Uh, since the geographical location and historical similarities, I prefer these three countries. Um, I mean, women who have come from these three countries as my research participants. So the path of acquiring a school teaching job has never been linear for most immigrant people, especially for women. The challenges might not be unique, but various difficulties have to be uh, faced uh, across a diverse group of international training teachers. Since 2005, Ontario has been facing a competitive job market for English teachers as the simultaneous fall of the number of retiree teachers and the increase of the level of new teachers who, come, who came from all over the world and other provinces to Ontario. In his very recent report, uh, Ontario College of Teachers claims that the gap between the number of newly licensed teachers and the forecasted number of retirees has been becoming closer for the past few years. The fact behind this claim is that many newly licensed teachers are not interested in continuing their job as school teachers, which is really, really scary for uh, our entire school boards. The downward uh, employment of racialized teachers have been documented in many research showing the tendency that the teaching professions in Canada continuously excluded, excluded non-white immigrants and linguistic minorities. In the time of global mass migration, where one can see that the increase of diverse immigrants in many aspects of lives, the number does not keep pace with that of educators working in the field of education. Here I can mention like Ausla Buller and Carl James who uh, quoted like color blindness where the existence of racialization in Canadian institutions um, uh, is uh, ignored are not, uh, are not seen in a white norm context. The issues of race, racialization and discrimination are considered against the so-called environment of culture, democratic and harmony. Uh, here, I just like to mention that uh, the professional integration of South Asian immigration, immigrant teachers, immigrant teachers face difficulties in their professional integration, unlike their counterparts, such as engineers and nurses, who presently benefit from the labor shortages of the fields. But rather, um, the systematic barrier, rather than individual responsibility, the systematic barriers are more responsible that prohibit immigrant teachers' inclusion in the economic education system. In Ontario, many new immigrant school teachers uh, work as on like daily occasional basis, like they work as on call, and it takes years for them to become permanent school teachers. Like uh, I took interviews and I would say like only 30% of my participants work as school teachers, I mean permanent school teachers, and the rest 70%, they like 
20% are unemployed and the remaining um, 50%, they, they have been working as a supply teacher for 10 years or 12 years. So it's, it's a long, long time. And that's why many women um, leave their job. They leave their job and they are focusing on another profession, uh, which is not actually their dream jobs. So they move school to school frequently and they miss the, I mean, basically the problem of South Africa is that they move from school to school frequently and they miss the extensive school-based professional development and do not have a chance for orientation, mentoring or professional evaluation along with less engagement with other educators in collaborative learning and uh, teacher inquiry as well. By not having a chance to participate in all those professional activities, many immigrant teachers stay in an isolated zone that does not allow them to cross and integrate themselves to their colleagues who work within mainstream teaching or with other groups. So yeah, do I have time or it's almost? Actually, you're pretty much at the end if you just want to wrap up in the last remaining seconds that you have, okay. Rosalina. Thanks. Okay. So I just want to mention that uh, the, in my uh, research design, I focus on, I, I use um, a feminist intermediate framework uh, because it's, I just want to know how women uh, explore their experiences. I mean, I want to, I want to know their experiences from their, from, from them. Uh, that's why I, I use a feminist interpretive inquiry, I mean, interpretive inquiry based on feminist perspective. Um, yeah, so I just, um, I think maybe yeah, we'll, so we'll, wrap it up. we'll wrap yes, it up there and yes, yes. Um, we'll have an opportunity for discussion. Mm -hmm. If, we, if sure. we stay on track, we'll have a long period for discussion at the end. Yes, and yes, sure. To expand on sure. some of these issues. So that'd be yes, great. Yes. Thank you very much, Rosalina. Yes. Going to turn it over now to our third presenter. Santiago Campero is going to talk about minority job search in software engineering. Over to you, Santiago. Great. Uh, can you guys uh, see my slides? Yes. Great. Excellent. Um, okay. So, uh, so in this study, I'm um, examining uh, the um, uh, workforce in the U.S. software sector. Uh, and in particular, the role that uh, foreign workers play uh, in this sector. Uh, we know uh, that foreign workers are quite prevalent uh, in uh, software uh, in the US. Uh, some estimates um, suggest, for example, that foreign born workers uh, constitute 37% of software developers in the US. Um, However, the um, uh, employment of these workers has long been uh, quite controversial. Uh, so on the one hand, some people say that um, these workers uh, contribute uh, to um, addressing important skills gaps uh, in the workforce uh, in this area, uh, whereas others uh, point to the fact that um, U.S. high-tech firms may exploit these foreign workers, uh, and that the fact that uh, firms rely on these foreign workers uh, contributes to depressing wages in the sector. So uh, one argument that's been made uh, for why these uh, foreign workers may actually contribute positively to the functioning of the U.S. labor market uh, is the fact that these workers might have higher rates of spatial mobility. So in particular, some uh, scholars have argued that uh, these immigrant workers grease the wheels of the labor market. Uh, and what they mean by that is that uh, these foreign workers uh, more easily move uh, from one region of the country to another uh, in response to different economic conditions. Uh, and in doing so, they go to where their skills are most needed uh, and therefore contribute to the efficient allocation of resources across regions. So um, extant evidence for this argument uh, is uh, mostly based on uh, 
work that has uh, looked at the clustering of immigrant workers across different regions. And what uh, this work uh, has generally shown is that new immigrants are clustered in areas uh, that offer the highest wages uh, for the skills that they offer. Uh, so in particular, in the software industry, uh, a lot of foreign workers are clustered in Silicon Valley, uh, which is the area that has the highest wages uh, for uh, software workers. So what I focus on in this paper is in really trying to understand uh, to the extent that these immigrant workers are clustered in these high wage areas. Uh, so what are the labor market processes that might be contributing to these, uh, to these clustering? Uh, because uh, as I was saying, the uh, arguments that are suggested in the literature really point to supply side factors, meaning that uh, what these uh, theories suggest is that the reason uh, immigrant workers are clustered in high wage areas uh, is because these workers are more mobile uh, and are attracted uh, by uh, higher wages. Uh, but what I argue is that we also need to consider demand side factors, meaning uh, the fact that uh, firms in different regions might have a differential propensity to favor uh, foreign workers. So, uh, so more specifically, uh, if you think about uh, the supply side of the labor market, um, what uh, uh, extent arguments would suggest is that uh, foreign workers are less attached uh, to place uh, than native workers in their uh, host country. Uh, and this is because uh, foreign workers lack the type of long-standing relationships that native workers have. Uh, and that generally constrain native workers from wanting to relocate to a different region of the country. So what this suggests is that if we think about job search behavior, uh, we, what we might expect if we compare foreign workers who are already living in the US uh, with native workers, uh, what we would expect is that foreign workers are less uh, constrained by space in the way they search for jobs. In addition, uh, what uh, the, uh, the literature uh, would also suggest is that uh, foreign workers are also more attracted to high wage areas. Uh, and this is because uh, foreign workers have fewer non-economic reasons, such as pre-existing social ties or past experiences living in different regions to favor uh, different regions of their host country. And therefore, we would expect that economic considerations play a larger role in their job search choices. So what this would suggest is that in terms of their job search behavior, uh, when, if we control for the distance uh, between a worker and a set of prospective jobs, uh, foreign workers are more likely to be attracted to jobs in high wage areas. On the other hand, if we consider the demand side of the market, uh, what we would expect uh, in general is that uh, firms are less likely to uh, wanna hire foreign workers. Uh, and furthermore, that, foreign work, that the extent of their disadvantage uh, is uh, less in markets where candidates are more scarce generally. Furthermore, these markets where candidates are more scarce are also likely to correspond to markets where wages are higher. Uh, and that follows simply from uh, uh, neoclassical economics that would suggest that wages are higher in uh, markets where uh, the balance of supply and demand in the market is more favorable to workers. Therefore, what this would suggest is that there's an association between uh, the prevailing wages in the labor market and the extent to which firms uh, penalize uh, foreign workers in their hiring process. So in this paper, I examined these arguments uh, using data from um, uh, the hiring of, of software workers through an online uh, recruiting platform. So this data includes detailed information on job postings 
importantly, for the purposes of this paper, it includes the location of the job. Uh, and it in also includes uh, detailed information on job applications, uh, including the location of the candidate home. So the data includes uh, a little over 40,000 applications uh, to uh, about 800 uh, software uh, engineer and developer jobs across a range of counties in the US. Um, so uh, in, in examining these relationships, I control for a number of other factors uh, that we would expect to uh, affect these um, relationships both on the supply and the demand sides. Uh, perhaps uh, most importantly, I control for the um, ethnic composition of the county where the job is located uh, because the, the literature on immigrant assimilation really highlights the fact that immigrants are very much uh, attracted to areas that have a higher prevalence of their co-ethnics. So uh, I account for that. Uh, also importantly, um, uh, in the U.S., uh, different firms have different policies with respect to sponsoring visas. Uh, so uh, another important um, element that I'm able to control for is whether the firm indicated in the job posting that uh, U.S. work authorization was required for the job, uh, therefore that they were not willing to sponsor visas. Uh, so I am able to control for that as well. Uh, I control also for a number of characteristics of the candidate, uh, as I was saying, ethnicity, uh, gender, but also uh, a range of uh, human capital variables. Uh, and uh, in terms of uh, how I set up the analysis, uh, first on the supply side, uh, what I examine is the probability of job applications. Uh, and so uh, here my dependent variable would be equal to one. Uh, if the candidate uh, applied to a given job uh, and equal to zero uh, for other jobs uh, on the platform uh, that were open at the time that the person applied. Um, so what I find first with respect to the influence of space, uh, I find uh, as you would expect that the probability of application to a job uh, goes down quite significantly uh, as you uh, consider jobs that are further away from the candidate. Uh, but what you can see also uh, from this chart is that the relationship is actually quite different uh, for US citizens as compared to foreigners. Uh, and as, uh, as I argued, uh, the relationship is less uh, pronounced for foreigners. In terms of substantive significance, uh, these effects uh, are actually quite um, quite big. If you take the first three quartiles in terms of distance uh, and you calculate the predicted uh, share of the um, of foreigners in the applicant pool, uh, what you get is that uh, foreigners are predicted to comprise about 44% uh, of the applicant pool among these candidates that are applying from very close distances. Uh, but if you uh, look at those candidates applying from very far away, uh, the percent of uh, foreigners uh, uh, nearly doubles. So at these uh, longer distances, foreigners comprise 86% of the applicant pool. If you look at the influence of county wage, on the other hand, uh, I find that the, that the effect uh, is a little bit stronger for foreigners, but uh, the effect is actually quite small. On the other hand, on the demand side, uh, if you look at the probability of interview uh, uh, by citizenship uh, across uh, jobs uh, uh, in counties with different levels of wages, uh, what you find overall is that foreigners are less likely to be interviewed as you would expect, uh, but the extent of their penalty of their disadvantage is a lot smaller in counties with higher wages, which is uh, consistent with my argument. Uh, again, in terms of substantive significance, the, the effect is, is actually quite large, implying that uh, in the highest wage counties, the percent of foreigners 
drops only about 4% going from the pool of applicants to the pool of people that are interviewed. But if you look at counties with the lowest wages, the percent of foreigners drops about 35% from the applicant pool to the interview pool. Uh, so in conclusion, foreign workers uh, resi residing in the U.S. apply for jobs with much less concern for space than U.S. citizens. However, foreign workers do not seem to be uh, more uh, attracted to jobs in higher wage regions. Rather, firms in higher wage regions are much less likely um, to penalize foreign workers in screening than firms in other regions. So what I hope to contribute with, it, with this study is um, a better understanding of the spatial distribution of immigrants, uh, which has uh, long been of uh, concern to both scholars and policymakers. Um, and in particular, uh, I hope these findings in this study can um, cast doubt on some, uh, uh, some of the existing work uh, on uh, on the effect of economic factors in driving immigrants to certain regions by pointing out that, that actually uh, it doesn't seem to be as much that immigrants themselves are uh, self-sorting into these high-wage regions, but it's rather that firms in these high-wage regions are much, likely to, much more likely to consider them. So I think I'll leave it there and um, I look forward to your questions. That's great. Thanks very much, Santiago. Our final presenter in this session is Stingting Zhang, and she is giving a paper, Healthcare Practitioners Without Borders, the Impact of Licensing Requirements on the Career Paths of Skilled Immigrants. Over to you. Thank you, Sheila. Uh, I'm waiting for Santiago to stop sharing. Actually, I think if you uh, start sharing, it overrides it. But oh, okay. Perfect. Give it a whirl. Yeah. Wonderful. So thank you for the opportunity to present. This is really a sorry. Let me just yes. This is a really a working progress. It's in a very pre preliminary stage. You know, the whole kind of research pace was thrown away by the COVID. And, but I still want to share like, you know, some of my like very early stage of finding and uh, any feedback and comment uh, uh, greatly appreciated. So this research really kind of motivated through the, the kind of like intersective work between sociology of work, sociology of profession and occupational licensing from economic, uh, economic literature. So I want to start looking in, into this, this whole, what we can see as the, the kind of like the most stringent occupational closure and, and the, the kind of like the, the in, in a sense from the literature and from the practitioner, even from like Rosalina's like, you know, talk, uh, this kind of like, you know, boundary that really impacts how people decide their career path, say, especially for skilled immigrants. And kind of like, I want to start from the, the definition of occupational licensing. And Robin kind of like defined this six element, common element of professional licensing law, right? Like in the licensing law, they establish a regulatory board or council. This is a professional association, typically assuming the self-regulation power. And they also define the, the education and other entrance standards in the law. Sometimes most of them also have this, what we call the grandfather clause. So if you are a previous member of the professional association in this licensing, the like, you know, unlicensed occupation, once we will get to the licensing status, you don't have to kind of retake the entering exam. You don't have to, you can just kind of grandfather in as a practitioner. And of, of course, one of the kind of important part about the professionalization project is really define the code of conduct because the, the kind of like, a, you know, the rationale for government to legislate this occupational regulation is really to protect public interest. That's the primary kind of uh, rationale for, for the whole discussion about occupational licensing law. And disciplinary provision and prohibition and the penalty for 
authorized practice. The right to practice is the essence or the foundation of the, the kind of occupational closure, right? Like the whole argument from the economic literature talking about the rent seeking and the, you know, the additional wage gap that you can extract as a profession based on the occupational licensing setting is this, this right to practice setting. And previous literature, especially in, in both sociology and economics, they, they focus on this, this, the downside about occupational licensing. Like, you know, uh, to summarize, it's really occupational licensing which restrict individual mobility. And they restrict the entry to, to the profession, right? Like by setting a high standard, so they can limit the supply of the practitioners. And that's the way that, you know, the channel and the mechanism that they protect the e economic rent for the incumbents. They also kind of like restrict mo mobility through inconsistent licensing standards uh, across different jurisdictions. This particular applied to actually uh, many different countries. Like in, in the state is particularly dominant. You have 50 states and they each have their own regulatory board. They have their own regulatory standards. If you want to for example, as a teacher, like, you know, you want to move from Massachusetts to Pennsylvania, you have to be relicensed in, in the state of Pennsylvania, even though you have the same kind of like, you know, educational credential in, in Massachusetts and you practice the same kind of job. And this is the same thing across Canada and across different provinces. This is the same thing that within the EU zone. So like, you know, different literature saying that inconsistent licensing standard really limit people like you know how they how mobile they are in terms of the geospatial and the distancing they travel between their home and, and work. People are less likely to kind of like a move across different states if they work in the licensed occupation. And of course like there's a kind of like an additional layer of the discussion which is a focus of my current research is this foreign practitioners also face significantly more entry barriers compared to like, you know, native professionals. This was resonated with the other presenters in this, this panel. And also folks are talking about, you know, there's a different kind of like a process and a different type of verifications, so like additional language requirement, all those things. Even though in Canada, we have a much better kind of like, you know, labor rights protections in terms of like a opening the, the, the kind of a restrictions for foreign practitioners or immigrant skilled immigrants, still empirical evidence suggests that, you know, immigrant skilled immigrants are less likely to re-enter and re-engage their, their professional works in which they held in their home country when they are moved to, to Canada. And there's a, a additional line of recent research that focus on in the US, they focus in the low level kind of like a low skilled occupations and seeing that, okay, you know, uh, hairstylist or nail polisher, like, you know, cosmetologists or barbers, they have a, a much difficult time to, to regain their kind of like the occupation when they move to the US. And it, it even trickle down, they have much, much harder kind of like time to, to open their own business, become an entrepreneurs, you know, uh, with the whole occupational licensing scheme. The kind of like upside in, in this whole barrier discussion is really, once you get your foot in the door for those skilled immigrants, or even like, you know, lower skilled immigrants, once you get your foot in the door, and then once you are able to repractice your professions within, you know, license the scheme, and then you are able to kind of like overcome the wage barriers that we typically see the wage discriminations between the, the, the immigrants and the native workers. So that's kind of like the, the only uptick, but like still the, the gate is so hard for those uh, professionals and the uh, immigrants to, to overcome. So this is really kind of like, you know, the, the overarching kind of like a background about the literature and what they find. My research question for this particular project is really start looking into the impact from a different angle. And particularly does occupational regulation funnel individual into a particular career path, right? Like, you know, previous study always saying, hey, if you have a trouble to get into the, the, the field to repractice in a different country, 
you know, you just withdraw. You get disappointed and you find a different career path. And what I try to understand is, is there any possibility for them to, to really, for immigrants, especially skilled immigrants, to navigate this, this licensing restriction and, you know, find an alternative kind of path that can somehow re-energize their skill set to be able to closely relate to what they practice in their home country, even though they cannot practice the same, you know, uh, occupation when they get into the new country. And if so, to, to what extent those career paths would be different between immigrants and native workers? This is kind of like a less, I would say secondary kind of a, a, a inquiry. I want to use a, a, a case studies in this particular project. And what I want to look into is really the professional doctorates in the healthcare sectors in the US. So here I give you the, the kind of like the cases that I picked. Those are the professional doctors, the, the, the people who got into the university and can grant a professional a, a degree, a doctor degree in those professional work in the healthcare sectors. Okay, so I picked the pharmacy, physical therapy, nursing, and occupational therapist, and, and the most recent ones as of 2018, you actually can doc, get a doctor of clinical laboratory science a degree from the university in the US. Those are the legit degrees approved by uh, the US Department of Education. Okay, so those are the really accredited schools that are providing those kind of education training. And here you see the, the, the line of like the year they are being kind of a award, force awarded, but it's really for those, if you look at those occupations that are pissed, picked, like they are not, you know, physicians, they are not lawyers, like I'm talking about healthcare, like this really, if you look, talk about the, the social sociology of professional lit, professional literature, this is kind of like a, we can consider as the semi professions within the healthcare care sector. Those kind of occupation has grown like significantly in the past, like I would say two decades. And those are the occupations that aggressively pursue occupational licensing practices and uh, privilege in the past two, three decades uh, across several countries. And just give you kind of like an example that you can maybe like more familiar with this. In Ontario, we have 41 licensing bodies and 26 are in healthcare sector. And 20, I would say 22 of them actually belong to this, what we call the semi-professional healthcare workers. They used to be a, a group of professionals but they somehow over time develop their exclusive knowledge base and they start building their, their brand and they get recognized. And now they start building this, what we call doctor degrees. So all of those doctor degrees that you have to get accredited from the uh, Department of Labor uh, assigned the licensing board and you have to take at least six years of education. So on, on the final column, you see that that's the number of accredited schools that in the US that currently can offer those degrees. And of course, like, you know, if you see the bottom line, the clinical laboratory science, they so far haven't have, they have a licensing body, but they have a 12 different kind of like a licensing things in terms of accreditation of their program. So there's no kind of like a consolidated number seeing that how many that have been offered this doctor degree. Of course, like given the time, I'm not going to talk about like all of them. What I'm going to see is I'm going to talk a little bit about the, the, the pharmacies and the occupational therapists. These are two kind of like a program that I'm been looking at so far. In terms of like, you know, the licensing process, if you are kind of like a, you know, traditional native born American student, this is a process you can get licensed as a pharmacist across all the states in, in the U.S. The interesting part about the health science or healthcare sector is that previously we talked about like, you know, there's a kind of like a state licensing body, state licensing kind of like a offices, they have a different standards, but for the healthcare sectors, at least they have a nationalized exam, okay? So from the education, you need to have the pharmacy degree from accredited schools for six years, and you need to pass this North American pharmacist licensing exam. And you also need to pass this, what we call the jurisdiction, jurisdiction 
jurisprudence exams. That means that you need to know the relative laws within your state or at least within your regions. And for most of the, the states, you need a minimum 1500 hours or 20 hours to be able to get licensed. Okay, so that's the domestic path. But if you are an immigrant skilled pharmacist, try to re-license, get regain your license and practice in, in the US, you have to go to the board of the licensing body, which is a national or federal kind of like, you know, accredited organization that take this, what we call the FPG EC certification exam, okay? So to be able to eligible to take the exam, you have to prove that you have at least five years of pharmacy curriculum in your home country. And you also need, this is a kind of ridiculous part, part in my opinion, you have to take the TOEFL exam. You have to get a satisfactory kind of grade to be able to take the certification program and pass the exam and then take the national pharmacy licensing exam, then you are eligible to find the internship and start looking for this 1500 hours training hours. And then also you need to pass the multiple pharmacy jurisprudence exam. So it's a lot harder for the immigrants to really go through this because it takes a significant longer. And also there's a certain kind of requirement that if you really take the TOEFL exam, why don't you do something else? And the most interesting part about this whole kind of comparison is that when we start looking at occupational therapist licensing kind of process, they have a very similar kind of structure, six year of program, pass the national exam, complete your field work requirement, but there's no alternative path for skilled immigrants. Absolutely nothing. So if you are skilled immigrants and practice the occupational therapist in the past, there's no way you can you can take, rec get recognized of your past experience or education without retaking the uh, kind of US path. Ting Ting, so, we're getting close to the yes. end if you want to sort of move maybe to your conclusions. Absolutely. So this is a kind of like my 30 second conclusion for what I find. I start looking at the alternative paths by looking at who's teaching those people, those folks in the professional degrees. Okay, so what I find is for pharmacists, you see a lot more foreign trained pharmacists that are doing pharmacy degrees and start teaching in the university. And I did the field kind of interviews and majority of them saying that because the, the kind of hectic licensing requirement, we decided just to go to university and then re, renew our education and become a, a university faculty. So, so significant of them actually going to that part. If you can do the, the pharmacist job, why don't you go teach? Because you have the qualification. And for occupational therapist, there's so far I haven't found any single university faculties that have foreign education background. Every single one that's so far in the accredited schools are domestic background. So this is something that I really want to kind of start diving, diving and really looking into how institution and what's the process of really shaping people's individual careers and especially for skilled immigrants. Yeah. Great. Thanks Thank very much, Ting Ting. Thank you to all four presenters. Um, you've, you've managed your time really nicely. So we have uh, about 25 minutes for questions. This session runs until 15 minutes past the hour. There is a question already in the chat and I'm, uh, it's directed specifically to Ting Ting, but I'm also wondering, um, if that's a good place to just collect everybody's thoughts and I can sort of regroup them and um, and pass them along in sort of a quasi organized way to to the members who presented today. Uh, so feel free to type your questions into the zoom group chat and in the meantime Yao Yao is asking uh, does the language test apply to English speaking immigrants to Ting Ting and that's in reference to your second last slide I think. Based on my kind of like information that I gather. Yes, everyone has to take the TOEFL exam. Okay, yep. thank you. So I'm not seeing any other questions, giving people a couple of minutes to get their thoughts uh, together. Um, I, I, I actually have a question, actually yep. two questions. 
Okay. One question is for Yao. I think it's very nice theoretical framework. Like it makes so much more sense, especially given the kind of dynamic change in, in professions. Uh, my question is really about the Chinese context, right? Like, you know, if we talk about lawyers in, in the Western context, like professional association plays a huge, huge deal. So the whole process of defining professional identity is almost happening at the kind of like professional, at, at the collective level. So my question is like in China, as far as my understanding, the, the professional association is minimal in terms of impact or, you know, helping people to define their, their identity. So does this play a role into your theoretical model kind of building? And I will hold the other question later. Yeah, do you want to yeah. tackle that? Yeah. Um, I would not, I would agree and not agree with that, what you said about the minimal influence of the professional association. And I think, um, as we all know, China is a super authoritarian state. And basically, um, I would say professional association is still playing a role, but it's just, it's more of a, um, a, tr a transmission belt of the state, of the wi 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 willingness of the state. So yeah, and uh, interestingly, during the, since 2018, since the start of my project, there has been two, actually quite a few, several very important central governmental policy in support of platform-based or innovative types of legal services. Therefore, the professional associations are actually quite supportive of this particular platform. And this p particular platform is actually having quite good relationships with a few provincial level per, uh, associations and using those associations to develop their own lawyer network. So for this study, because it's more of an OBOT based, so it's there, I, I'm not seeing how like, the association is playing a role in this particular theoretical framework, but I, I do have some thoughts of um, future studies focusing on the institutional uh, aspect. And uh, following up with the answer, your answer about even like the Canadian immigrants to the States will still have to take the TOEFL exam. I'm really seeing this story and the US, those professional associations, those legislators using these barriers to protect their own jurisdictions instead of really control the, the quality of the new people who are entering their profession. So it's more of a story of helping to promote their own uh, status and uh, economic well-being instead of really to, per to, to ensure the quality of professional service. And um, also, I have this question of overall, you, were, you have been see, 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 um, framing your question as to how this is impacting people's career path. But um, I, I don't know if you have given a thought over framing this as a phenomenon, as a, just as a form of professional stratification, because I see these medical professions are those dependent professions, like the, in the, in, among all the medical professions, apparently the medical doctors, the, the physicians, they are the dominant one, and nursing, all the therapists, they are dependent. So I'm thinking um, if you could actually uh, frame this uh, career path story in terms of professional stratification in that the immigrants, the minorities are more likely to get into those dependent uh, professions or, Thanks, it's, or if it's not a suitable way of framing. We're going to collect a couple of other questions. So Ting Ting, hold oh, your sure. thoughts on that response around stratification. Sure. Um, Santiago has typed in uh, for Santiago, ML is asking, are there similar trends in, in Canada? So hang on to that thought as well. And Dion Poehler uh, would like to chime in with a series of questions. I'm not sure who they're for. So let's gather all these questions together and then go back to the presenters. Go ahead, Dion. Yeah, so just, uh, I just loved all of these presentations. I have two questions. One first, Santiago, can you just um, re-explain why, like the theory for why you predict made that prediction um, on the high wage, right, that you wouldn't necessarily, I, I just, I kind of missed the, the, the core sort of theory there. Mm -hmm. um, and then for um, 
uh, Yao. Um, I know, Yao, that in the framing of your, um, in, it, you've been struggling with the framing of your paper a bit um, and, uh, and, and sort of thinking about framing it in the dirty work um, literature. And I actually think that this framing works really well and I just but I just wanted you to talk about why you think that that framing in the dirty work literature would be better than counter institutions um, if you think there is a reason. Great thanks I think we'll go to Santiago first. Santiago there are a couple things that um, the audience wants to hear about Canadian trends in Canada and Dion's uh, question about the theoretical framing around your prediction. Go ahead. Sure. Yeah. So, um, so in terms of ML's question, uh, yeah, I think it, it's a great question, and I think it would be very relevant to examine these same issues here in Canada, because I know that from a policy standpoint, there's a lot of interest in um, in, in in the fact that that a lot of immigrant communities are clustered in a few large urban centers, and and what would be some ways to potentially um, incentivize people to settle in different areas. So I think it's a great question. I don't have any Canadian data. So if you or anybody has any thoughts on where I could get data that could help us answer those questions here in Canada, I would love any suggestions. Uh, and in terms of uh, Dion's question, um, so I think, so, th so the way I would say it is, um, uh, in terms of the supply side, the argument would be that uh, because immigrants have fewer ties um, to any particular region in their host country, that their decisions about where to locate are more uh, driven by economic factors, right? Because in essence, there's fewer non-economic things that could come into play for them. Uh, so that's on the supply side. And then on the demand side, the argument would be that um, because uh, firms in high wage regions uh, have in general a harder time finding candidates, uh, they'll be more open to hiring foreigners. Uh, and so the disparities in hiring rates uh, in these regions between natives and foreigners, you would expect would be narrower, right? Just because uh, firms are in essence more uh, more desperate to find candidates, and so they're more willing to consider foreign candidates. All right, thanks very much. Uh, I'll throw it back to Ting Ting. Would you like to make a comment about um, the the notion of stratification in the professional ranks? Yeah, thank you. I, I think it's a very interesting kind of discussion, especially in the health healthcare sector, when you talk about like a you know occupation stratifications, because they have been kind of like diverging to so many different sub professions in the past several, several decades. And interesting, I think another interesting part about this is really start looking at the boundary of the expert knowledge that they define, because that's the base of how they kind of separate themselves from each other. If you start looking at the nursing team and then the pharmacist and the occupational therapist in this case, like they, their not boundary of knowledge is pretty well defined and also kind of enriched over time because of the technology change because like the most sophisticated healthcare practice that we have. But I do kind of like feel that there are certain kind of occupational stratification we can look into. For example, in the US context, like occupational therapists and physical therapists, they are actually in the competing work, but they represent two separate group of professionals. They define similar kind of knowledge, but you know, they represent two different kind of like competing force in the professional world. So I do think stratification at this point happened in certain areas. But in, if we want to kind of generalize into in the whole kind of layered healthcare sectors, it's going to be hard. We do see like a most kind of stratification over time. For example, the nurse, nurse practitioners versus registered nurse and the nursing assistant, right? Like, you know, we do see layered structures happening along the line. But in terms of like the whole sectors, I think there's a lot of things to step up. I'll use my privilege as chair to just interject something for you to think about. A very interesting, Ting Ting, when you talk mm -hmm. about defining boundaries in terms of expert knowledge. Um, 
there's another layer, particularly when we're talking about healthcare professionals, and that's the notion of scope of practice. Yes. which is distinct from the body of knowledge, but related. Yep. And that's often where the negotiation takes place around boundaries. Mm -hmm. um, and the regulatory body has a really prominent role to play um, in terms of defining scope of practice and enforcing that and mm -hmm. advocating in the employment situation, uh, particularly where employees are in dependent employment, hired, say, by a large hospital or a healthcare authority. Um, and that brings us to the uh, Chinese comparison and what we were talking about earlier in terms of Yao's paper um, and the role of the regulatory body, um, which is very much a transmission belt, which we see in the accounting profession in China, which we see in the labor movement in, in um, organization enterprise unions in China as well. So um, a, a part of scope of practice involves penalties yeah. for exceeding your scope of practice. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's another sort of interesting dimension. Absolutely. But taking it back to Yao, um, I wonder if you have any um, sort of response or comment uh, to uh, Dion's suggestion around framing your paper. Yeah, I just feel so weird because uh, one hour ago I've been trying to persuade you on my story, but now I'm trying to undermine it myself. So the reason I've been uh, hesitating over this framing is um, I think it's possible possibly because the last version of the paper as a habit of an IR student, I had a, a section in the literature review talking about the rise of non-standard employment and the platform-based uh, non-standard employment. And therefore, as people who give me the comment say, okay, now you're trying to tell me this is rising, this is important. Now we, suddenly in the, in the next section, you're telling me this is counter-institutional, but in the non-standard work, non work section, you're basically telling me, okay, this is being normalized. This is now not that counter-institutional. This is the one uh, major um, reason I got uh, this comment, but I think this is, can be easily corrected by downplaying that uh, non-standard employment argument. But the reason that I've been having the, the hesitating for myself is because um, this so called lawyers, according to the other information I got from the interviews, they are lower rank lawyers who work in those non prestigious firms and uh, they struggle with getting enough work. So a lot of these issues like uh, low difficulty tasks and uh, not so well educated clients are not that new to them. And plus, lawyers' work are gig-based. So it's not only gig-based, but it's gig-based from the start. So there are many aspects. If, like, say, medical doctors are engaged in this type of work, it is for sure counter-institutional. But for lawyers, especially this group of lower-rank lawyers, I think there are quite a few reasons to, to give me a rebuttal over, oh, this is not that counter-institutional. If you hadn't said it, I was going to say it, that law work is by definition gig work. It's file yeah. by file, problem by problem. Mm -hmm. And in some instances, diagnostic medical work is also inherently gig yes. work. Mm -hmm. And it has shifted as we've seen professions move from the traditional independent sole practitioner model into dependent employment on a large scale. And I wonder, Ting Ting, if that's something for you to think about as well in conjunction with this stratification notion and that is where are these people located and what is their employment relationship and mm -hmm. what role does that play in uh, professional opportunities, professional identity and their ability to navigate uh, these, these different regulatory frameworks because um, we think of nurses, for example, in a very particular context, partly because of the way the profession grew up within an organization setting compared to doctors who have traditionally been independent sole practitioners and self-regulated. Now, doctors are increasingly, of course, independent employment relationships, but to what extent does their employment relationship influence some of these experiences that they're having? That might be another potential direction to explore. Absolutely, like the, the, the kind of a competing logic between corporate professions and uh, kind of like, you know, the real professions kind of like being really embedded in this whole discussion in terms of training and how, where they find a job and where they locate their job, you know, what kind of employment relation they engage. So yes, definitely something I will look, I will look into. 
I have a question. Sorry, Tia, you have a question? Uh, yeah, just, I mean, well, so just to resp uh, response to Yao and then a question yeah. for Rosalina. Um, so to Yao, um, I, so I think like, you know, that counter institution framing, maybe if, if you think that that's not going to be sellable, you could downplay that. But I still think the professional identity and the threats to professional identity and status is a much better framing than the idea of dirty work. And just everybody else in the call, I read a sort of a reframing that Yao was going to Put it into it. I just don't. I don't. I don't think that that works. Like the dirty work framing. I think that the professional identity stuff is right. Maybe the counter institutions needs to be downplayed, or maybe the fact that this is normal because it is changing in China, right? Even as Sheila says, it is what legal work is gig work. So it's not that it's not the gig work aspect of it that's new, but it it is a new sort of platform mediated form of gig work that creates these different kinds of threats to professional identity. And so that is where I, I do think maybe that's kind of where you go with it a little bit in a bit of a reframe. Um, and then for Rosalina, just a quick question about um, uh, like if you, and I apologize because some of your um, talk actually cut out for me a little bit. And so uh, it was kind of, uh, um, I don't know if it was my side or the microphone, but if you had to sort of say what was like one or two of the defining um, experiences based on your research that sort of, that if you were sort of going to talk about um, how South Asian women immigrant teachers think about their, their I, I guess back to Yao's, how, how they think about their, uh, their work, what would, what would you say those, the one or two things are? Uh, no, actually I'm, uh, it's a, uh... Uh, it's about um, their experiences, exploring their experiences. So basically my research participants worked as teachers in their native land and they have come here as immigrants and now they are uh, exploring to become a teachers and most of them already got the teaching licenses but still they are not getting jobs. I mean permanent jobs. As I mentioned that uh, my participants like uh, 20% um, of them are doing permanent jobs because they are, there are so many systematic barriers and uh, so many complications of becoming a permanent teacher in Toronto. I mean, different school boards in Toronto and uh, how they are uh, facing those challenges. So my paper, I mean, my thesis is basically exploring their experiences and uh, how do they see their struggles and challenges in a new context. I mean, post-migration situation. So they are already teachers here. They already have upgraded their skills, but still they are not getting permanent jobs. Uh, they are surviving on occasional jobs, which is like, I mean, most of them, like they, are, they have been doing uh, temporary jobs for 10, 12 years and how they are deprived in a new city. So these are the experiences uh, I like to focus on. And my participants also share their experiences, how they are facing those challenges. So it's about, yeah, it's about their experiences. I have a quick question, follow up to that, Rosalina. Um, yes. Rosina, sorry. Um, what role might unions be playing in the experience that these teachers are having? I, I, do your participants have any contact with organized labor? Um, do they see differences depending on the school board and the union that represents them? Are they um, not having any contact? What, what's your experience with, with the teachers' union? Because teachers' unions are traditionally very strong in Ontario and in the city of Toronto in particular. Uh, well, uh, it's not about actual teachers' union. Like none of my participants ever mentioned their contact with the union because they are already a um, uh, equity law in Ontario. But the interesting thing is that, I mean, Ontario always focuses on uh, taking more diverse teaching group in education system, but unfortunately there is uh, no way how to achieve the goal. I mean, there is law, there is, uh, you know, but uh, there is no how to execute that law. So none of my participants ever mentioned their tie with the uh, um, union. And uh, I mean, like, it's, uh, it's a situation like that, uh, they're kind of scared. Like, I mean, like, uh, it's, it's a new situation, new country, a new context. And teaching is not like another uh, profession, like not like engineers, not like doctors and nurses. It's very, very uh, different because it's, the skills are not easily transferable for teaching. 
especially school teaching. So uh, it's uh, uh, like, you know, no, they, they didn't never mentioned in union. They never mentioned. Okay. Uh, we have then, a couple of minutes left. Are there further questions? Yeah. Uh, can I, yeah, I have a question for Santiago. Like, you know, when you define foreign workers, like, can you separate like foreign workers from the foreign workers who educated and trained domestically? Do you see any difference? Um, I, um, so I could look at that. Um, I haven't, but yeah, it's, um, yeah, it's, it's a good question. So for the foreign workers who are educated domestically, you, you would expect them maybe to behave more like U.S. citizens, I guess? Yeah, or like, you know, something in the middle. Like, I, I, I would just imagine they will be behaving slightly different. Maybe not completely like in, close to the native. Right. Yeah, that's a good question. Yeah. And also, the source, the, the source of the region matters in your analysis? Um, so, so, in the results I showed you, I had, um, I had the home county fixed effects. So, uh, so this um, controls for uh, for heterogeneity uh, between regions. Uh, so I I, I haven't seen um, from what I recall like strong regional variations. It seems like overall mm -hmm. uh, this is this is mostly the pattern that I see. Okay, cool. And another thing that I want to kind of comment when you see that you know high wage company or region, high wage regions company are more like to, or more open to hire kind of like a, uh, immigrants. And I think like, you know, another kind of explanation could be, or mechanism could be, you know, when you have intensive competition, like, you know, firms are less likely to concern the, uh, uh, paying lower wage for high talent, for top talent. So mm -hmm. they are going to be less discriminatory in terms of mm -hmm. who they want to hire. Right. That could open the kind of like a whole discussion because you are talking about software engineer and, uh, you know, we typically see that lots of foreigners have kind of like, you know, relatively, I would say, advantage in that sense. So that's right. a kind of like a different angle to explain. Right. So it could be that, um, yeah, that, that firms in high wave regions are, yeah, are less discriminatory because it would be more costly for them to discriminate. Exactly. Yeah. 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 But it's fascinating research and very interesting. Thank you. That just about brings us to the end of our allotted time. I want to thank all of the presenters for the work that you've done and the work that you shared with us and for all the participants as well for your patience with the technology and your interesting questions that have inspired some great conversations today. Thank you all. And uh, stay well. There's still lots of ILERA ahead today and tomorrow. And of course, there are some pre recorded pieces that are available um, on the ILERA website with links from the program that you can enjoy at any time. Thank so, you, Sheila, for your organizing and uh, amazing comments. Well, take care, yeah. everybody. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Bye.